Jason Gaddis, welcome to the Naked Connection. I am so excited to have you here today, especially to help us all learn how to fight well, navigate conflict, and really just be in good relationships. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah. Well, I would love to start off um, by asking you what really got you into, you know, writing the book, getting to zero, helping people navigate conflict. What inspired this to happen for you? Uh, The short answer is relationship pain and doing conflict and relationships pretty poorly my most of my life. And, you know, on one level, I had lots of friends. Eventually, I figured that out in my late adolescence, but I felt alone and I was keeping people out and I didn't know I was doing that. Um, and then I had a series of short term intimate relationships in my 20s that all never lasted, mostly because I made the woman wrong and um, was unwilling to look at my part. Anytime things got uncomfortable, I would just push her away and find a new partner to date. And uh, then I saw finally that that was my issue. It was like time to change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where the pain is greater than staying in in something like that makes you shift and move. Yeah, tremendous amount of pain for a long time. Then it's like, okay, which I I think a lot of men are, are like that. We wait until things get really painful. Mm-hmm. then we'll take action, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and thank you for sharing that. And I'm curious if you could define what, like, what is conflict? What does that mean to you? Or like, I think sometimes we all have different ideas of what fighting looks like, what conflict looks like, like what is it to you? Yeah. It's um, usually some kind of rupture in our connection. It's a disconnection. It's an unresolved issue that we haven't been able to work out. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily screaming and yelling, although it could be that. It can be silence. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, what matters is there's a, a snag between two people of some kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know that, um, you know, we all kind of show up in conflict differently. And yeah. yeah. And like you just mentioned, it can be really silent or it can be really loud. And like I know personally, I get really silent when I'm in Mm -hmm. a state of conflict. So um, I know in your book, you actually talked about how there are four disconnectors and I would love if you could kind of break those down and share what they, how that, the way that we show up in conflict, how does that impact our success to get out of it? Because I think so often when we don't know how we're showing up in something, it can be really hard to change it. Completely. Yeah, true. Yeah, so I, I say that, you know, based on sort of the nervous system and the brain, And I've noticed over time, so people most historically talk about the fight, flight, freeze, faint response. Mm -hmm. So I talk about them in terms of posture, collapse, seek, or avoid. And you can think about it like a diagram. Posture is going up, collapse is going down. You could say seek is going to the right, um, avoid is going to the left, visually if you need that. And um, we, some of us get big and intense and want to talk, and some of us want to crawl in a hole in a shell and hide out. Some of us want to run away. All of us do it a little differently, but probably the most common pattern that I see over time is really, and it's based on attachment or attachment style or just sort of the the wiring from our earliest relationships is we either go toward the other person or we move away from the other person. Those are the two main challenges people have in a lot of relationships we people don't know how to navigate that because it seems like this unresolvable tension Mm -hmm. yeah and it feels like usually people are in relationship with someone who does the opposite like it's never two people that are coming towards or (laughs) going away um so if someone's in that dynamic let's say how how can they pause that and move away from it so that they're both meeting each other in a place where it feels safe to resolve their issue. Yeah. Uh, this is where a lot of people get stuck. I mean, it's, to me, it's, if we look at, um, when I get activated, let's say you and I are in a relationship, I get activated by you, you get activated by me. We have sort of a default setting in our nervous system that we're going to just automatically do. And you said you get Mm -hmm. silent, right? So you're more withdrawing type 
and I might get more anxious and I want to talk. And the self-awareness, if we have the awareness that there's nothing wrong fundamentally with us, this is just how we seem to be wired given our 18 years with our parents or caregivers. Mm -hmm. There's, and, and I, you see that about me, like, gosh, this just seems to be how I'm wired. You're not wrong, Jason. And we have compassion and understanding. Then we can start to be creative as a team. Like, okay, well, you know, when you retreat, I, I get anxious. And when I get anxious, you want to retreat further. So mm -hmm. how are we going to together be a team working out this kind of fundamental pattern when we're under stress? So people need to, you know, start behaving like a team to solve that problem. Instead, a lot of people think that you just need to stop being silent. You need to stop being anxious. You need to stop. And it's like, it's kind of, you're asking someone to do the impossible. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I don't recommend that. Instead, it's like, how can we collaborate to be caring and considerate of what happens to both of us under stress? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think that there's kind of this, you have to like meet each other halfway sort of a thing almost of, Hey, mm -hmm. I need to go take some space. Like if you're with, like, as me, I'm with withdrawing, I'm like, Hey, I just need a little bit of time, but actually being able to communicate that. And then not taking so much time that it causes the other person to just continue to be under stress. Yeah. People that withdraw kind of some, depending on their history again, they literally forget about the other person. They, they actually mm -hmm. go that offline. They're just thinking about protecting themselves and getting space. And whereas the other person is kind of left themselves behind and all they're thinking about is the other person, or that's what they say, but mm -hmm. often their, their anxiety is coming from, you know, their pursuit of connection is coming from their own need to relieve their own anxiety, which is very self-absorbed. So both people are self-absorbed in those moments under stress, just trying to <laughs> kind of make it better and protect themselves. Um, and we can, we can do better if we collaborate. And like you said, we come meet in the middle perhaps and find mm -hmm. solutions that are work for both of us. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, just like, I guess, what kind of, have you seen any specific type of solutions work in this dynamic in the past, whether it's like a specific thing to communicate about or yeah. an action to take? Absolutely. So agreements ahead of time are really great. So one simple agreement is we never let anything go more than 24 hours without doing our best to resolve it. Mm -hmm. Um, and we all have busy schedules and busy lives and for parenting and, you know, so, and we're exhausted and we have health issues. So you have to agree on a time frame that works for your busy lives. So 24 hours, I think is doable for most people, but if it's not, then it's 48 hours. But the longer we go without resolving anything, the more it goes into long-term memory and then it compounds. So every single unresolved issue that we don't resolve goes into long-term memory and it compounds. And so we're next time we have a rupture, all of those historical snags that we didn't deal with wake up. Mm -hmm. And now it's more intense. And that's why people say, gosh, you're making such a big deal out of nothing. It's just a comment I said, or I just rolled my eyes. Like, what's the big deal? And it's like, well, there's this huge um, long line of unresolved times when this has also happened now that we're dealing with that, you know, it's just, so people need to understand like the sooner you get it done and get back to a good place, the better. Yeah, no, that's so true. I've slowly learned that in my own life over time, like addressing conflict faster and faster makes it smaller and smaller. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah and, and gives you the relief you're actually looking for, which is not to be disconnected and by yourself. The relief you really want is to be connected whether you're with them or by yourself, like you want to feel connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And kind of, you're making me think about like in relationships when we're holding grudges or there's kind of this thing that happens, I feel like where people are keeping score and maybe that's kind of connected to the duration of time that where this becomes like more long-term and it feels like a bigger thing than it is. But what do you do with couples that are constantly holding a grudge or they're building resentment or, you know, they're in that space where they're, um, where they are keeping score. Mm -hmm. 
Well, first, they, if there's resentments and grudges, they have to take responsibility for that. That you know what I'm, I'm here. I am holding resentments and grudges because I haven't learned to work through this. Mm -hmm. So it's not a blame thing. Like it's your fault that I have a resentment. It's actually my responsibility to deal with that resentment with you in a collaborative way. Mm -hmm. How how can we do that together? Um, people get again under stress. People get very self focused, and and the work is how can I keep you in mind while I'm going down, or while I'm triggered, or while I'm upset? How can I continue to think about you? And that's a skill that's actually one of the hardest I I think to do for most of us under stress. But that's the work, and yeah. um, strong couples are able to do that more often than not. Yeah. Yeah. That is really hard to do when you're in that state and you're trying to take care of yourself, but to still be able to think about, I guess, not only the other person, but also the relationship, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and some of the work I've been studying, it's like when you're in a conflict, instead of being like, it's me versus you, it's like, how are we going to fight for our relationship as like, as though it's its own entity in and of yeah. itself. Um, so I guess how knowing how hard it is to kind of like be able to think about the other person or think about the relationship, how can we start to do that? Yeah, I mean it, it goes against all of our self-protective mechanisms, but in if we can um you know, if we claim we want a mutual badass powerful partnership, then we need to act like it um mm -hmm. with our daily actions. So, mm -hmm. respect, interest, care, um empathy, understanding the impact of our behavior on the other person and then stepping into a frame that I call standing for three that you were sort of alluding to there, which is we don't want to um, abandon ourselves to make the relationship work, right? That doesn't work either. Some people do that and that's not, mm -hmm. that's not what we're after. We're after everybody gets to be authentically who they are and take a stand for their own needs and desires and vision and each person does that and we stand for the relationship. So I stand for myself. I stand for my wife. She stands for herself. She stands for me. And we both stand for the relationship. So that's all three. And uh, having that view is like, why would I do something that's good for me, but not good for you or good for us? Mm. It, like it makes no sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no, that's a really good point. And um you've kind of talked a lot. I mean, a lot about how we like go into ourselves. And so I know inner conflict is such a big piece of this, how, and, and how can we, I guess, move out of, or move through the inner conflict to be able then to have better external conflict with other people or anything in our life? Yeah. I mean, I guess, for maybe the listeners that haven't read the book there, yeah, yeah. it's important. I just explain what the inner conflict yeah. is. <laughs> and so, um, when we're little kids, we, most of us grew up in environments where we got the message that some parts of us weren't welcome. So mm -hmm. whether we were uh, too emotional or sensitive or whatever it was. And so we sequestered that and repressed it and pushed it away because that created problems in our family or on the playground. And so we start to develop a strategic self basically to get through life and to get through our family, but at the expense of our true self, which is like, we got the message, oh, this isn't welcome. So I'm going to kind of hide it and I'm going to lead with what is socially acceptable, what the big people prefer, what gets me the least amount of pain and the most amount of belonging and connection. And that rift between the strategic self and the true self, I call the inner conflict. And that leads to, if it, that persists over time, which it does for a lot of people, it, it turns into depression and anxiety, like feeling off mm -hmm. that, gosh, my, you know, I, I'm just off. I have friends. It was like me. I had a lot of friends, but I wasn't being myself. I was being whatever I, that friend group wanted me to be, what I perceived would get me the most amount of belonging, right? Mm -hmm. The least amount of rejection. So I shape-shifted to belong, but I, at the expense of feeling no. And so I, I didn't, have anyone really understand who I was and take a deep, deep interest. Women that I dated kind of did, um, but I wouldn't let them in anyway. Anyway, I was suffering inside because I you can't be fulfilled when you're being a strategy, when you're not being yourself, when you're putting on a mask. There's no fulfillment in that long term, which is good feedback. So the way the good news about 
long-term partnership, for example, is it's very hard to hide in a marriage. And if you have kids, it's also very hard to hide around your kids. Like your shit comes out, you act kind of mean, you raise your voice, you do a bunch of things that are, you know, kind of hurtful and kind of disappointing and kind of messy and kind of ugly. And that's your true self emerging because your, your real feelings are wanting to be put out there. Mm -hmm. And so that's the beauty. And also the difficulty of marriage is it's coming out often sideways, but it's coming out so that it can be loved not only by you, but your person. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's how we heal the inner conflict is we start speaking up, speaking the truth, saying what's really in our heart and on our mind. And that's, and we have to risk losing people in that process because people might go away because we've trained everybody that we're, oh, I'm really easygoing. I'm just a, you know, this is my strategy. I don't ever get upset. And then all of a sudden I'm upset and they're like, what dude, who are you? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the inner conflict's a cool, you know, concept because it's a, a real hero's journey to come back home to who we actually are. And I think relationship as a path is the most effective way to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's so many things in that. It's beautiful to hear that kind of description of the power of relationship. And so what would you say if someone's listening and they're like, I think that I might be really out of alignment with what's my true self. How can you, like, what are the first, you know, you said speaking up, but like, what are some of the things that we can do to start moving back towards our true selves? Yeah. I mean, the first thing is we look at the signs and symptoms in our life and see if it's true that we're not fulfilled. Like a lack of fulfillment in one's life is a sign that you're off path or you're trying to be someone you're not, or you tried to live out the, what your parents or culture told you you should be like, or how you should act or what career you should have. And that's always a dead end for fulfillment. So if you can be honest, that's the first step. And then it is about starting to tell the truth with yourself first, as you look in the mirror, like, wow, I'm really unfulfilled. And, uh, it seems that I've created my life such that, um, I've got everybody trained to not know me. I feel like they, they all like my mask and I feel really alone inside. And then to tell one person to sort of call yourself forward with a therapist, a coach, or a close friend or a partner saying, Hey, this is, I've sort of betrayed myself along the way in my life. And now uh, I'm in the pain of that. So I'm going to feel that. So the other thing is we've got to feel all of the emotions and insights that come, which isn't always fun. <laughs> and then we can make a commitment to make, make a journey back home and um, really commit to like, all right, this is my sole purpose now is to be authentically me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to create a practice with two close friends or pick the number uh, of truth telling. And I'm going to just say what I actually think and feel. And I'm going to ask people to not abandon me and go away. But if they're, if it's too much, then they're welcome to go. So we can start setting up a playground, if you will, to practice being ourselves and so where we can get reps in every day and start being honest, you know, with the people around us. Yeah. No, that so like just kind of hearing what you're saying, it's like first being honest with ourselves, like kind of getting out of that denial. Cause I think sometimes we like want to hide it from ourselves. So yeah. being honest with ourselves and saying it actually to ourselves, looking in the mirror, being able to admit it really, yeah. and then starting to slowly share this with someone that you trust, someone that you care about. And then from there, mm -hmm. allow things to start happening. Yeah. Um, I feel like just thinking about my own personal experiences, I've definitely had that. And there is like this unraveling of the people in your life. And so it can at times like feel lonely in that, but yeah. I feel like ultimately the more true we are to ourselves, the happier we can be and the more fulfilled we can be. Um, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And you, yeah, you said it well, you know, this as a therapist, like when you are on the growth path. Um, you have to, uh, if you are growing, there's gain and loss with growth. And so, and there's no way around that. I've found there's no hack or shortcut or long cut. Like there's, it's just inevitable that you're going to lose some people if you keep growing. Cause most people are not growing. They're looking for what's comfortable. How can I just make my life so easy and predictable 
And how can I get away from pain and discomfort? And how can I avoid hard things? Mm -hmm. That's how most people, most Americans anyway, are setting up their life. And it's a, that's why the hero's journey, I love that concept because it's like, it's hard. We're going to be slaying some dragons along the way and it's going to be intense and we're going to have to feel some shit. We're going to have to let go of some people mm -hmm. on our way back home um, to, to be truly who we are. And if we can kind of just get our mind around, okay, that's part of the path. That's part of the territory. Then we can decide, do I want to make the journey or not? Cause it's okay. If you don't, um, you're just not going to be fulfilled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. And I think that perhaps there, there are some instances where people have gone so far down a path, it's almost, it feels impossible yeah. to, to unravel and get out of it. So are there, you know, if you, like, if you have a family and you have kids and you have all of these people relying on you that really mean something to you, even though it might not be in alignment with what you would ultimately have desired for your life, can you still find ways to be true to yourself? Yeah, totally. Yeah, there's always a way, right? Um, even in our in a little whisper during the day, or with our therapist or coach, um, you know, it's it's great to have like outlets. But the work is we want to be doing this most hours, being ourselves, right? Because mm -hmm. um, there's just a tremendous cost, as Gabor Mate wrote in his book Myth and Normal. There's a huge cost if we're not expressing ourselves and being who we are. It's it's an immense health burden and a mental health burden, physical health burden to be jammed up. And some of us do find ourselves in, you know, we've put ourselves, there's no victims here. We've put ourselves, we've made choices mm -hmm. to be financially dependent, for example, and to not to raise kids and not build our career. For example, there's a cost to that. It's a beautiful thing. And if you're financially dependent, it gets harder and harder to break out of a really dysfunctional marriage, for example, mm -hmm. because how are you going to take care of yourself and how are you going to pay the rent? And, um, but again, if we take the warrior's mindset, there's, there's always a way it just is a steeper path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned something about like, as you're going through this process, feeling everything and moving through the emotions and the pain and, and all of everything that comes with making a shift like this back to yourself, what, would you recommend if someone doesn't have the capacity yet to access their emotions to move through them? I know there are a lot of yeah. men listening have struggles with that where they've kind of shut down emotionally. Mm -hmm. How can you welcome that back in? Yeah. I mean, intellectually welcoming it back in is a great first step. Like I know this is probably good for me um, to feel mm -hmm. because if you want a great relationship long term, which most men, if they're honest with themselves, do want, um, especially as they get older. There's a there's just a like, yeah, I don't want to be alone. I want a partner. I wanna I wanna have a person that like knows me deeply and that's got my back. And okay, if that's true, you're gonna suck hard at being with their emotional experience. And if it's a heteronormative relationship, male, female, you're gonna be terrible at being with your wife's feelings. And that's going to create a big impact and cost over time. Mm -hmm. So that should motivate you to the way to feel her feelings and empathize with her is to feel your own first. You've got to be in contact and have a range of feeling sadness and grief and anger and hurt and fear and, and even, and all the positive emotions as well. So our ability to feel as men actually is this amazing elixir and lubricant for emotional heart connection with a woman or, you know, with another man or whatever, but mm -hmm. it's a, it's a key step. So getting your mind around that and saying, okay, I get that. That, that makes sense to me. Now, how can I actually go feel? Um, I mean, I was a guy in therapy when I first went was the therapist would ask me, how you, how do you feel today? And I'd say, I don't know, you know, for months. And then eventually it was, I feel numb. And then it was like, well, I'm feeling the kind of tension in my throat. Like it just took me a long time. Um, you know, psychedelics now we have that as a kind of a firecracker or something to like crack something open. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes that use the use of psychedelics in a, you know, healthy, conscious facilitated way in a really good, with a good guide and set and setting can help a man feel, take those first steps. Um, a men's group, um, you know, certainly going into therapy and talking about, you know, one of the first steps is to basically say, 
I'm keeping you out, therapist. I'm, I'm, I've got a wall and I'm not going to let you in. Taking responsibility for the ways in which we're guarded and protecting ourselves is actually a great first step rather than try to, you know, mow down the wall or knock down the door or break the castle moat or, you know, whatever thing it's, it's like, actually I, I have a wall and it serves a purpose. I'm protecting myself. Owning that is also can be vulnerable and kind of a cool first step as well. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Just to like sit with being like, I have this giant wall here and to like mm -hmm. explore what that's like to admit and to acknowledge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I always think it's interesting when people are like, oh, I don't feel anything. I'm numb. And I'm like, well, numbness is a sensation. Like numbness is mm -hmm. in many ways a feeling. And so oftentimes I find like underneath the numbness is like where everything lives. So if you just sit yeah. with the numbness for a little bit, it usually kind of shows you what else is there. Totally. Um, yeah. And another thing is guys need to stop <clears throat> medicating, you know, like I used a lot of drugs and alcohol to medicate to not feel essentially mm -hmm. to try to feel better. Um, so another good practice for men is to stop all the ways in which you escape and just, you know, strip away most of your vices and you're going to start feeling a lot of discomfort pretty fast. Mm -hmm. You don't have anywhere to send it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to run from discomfort when you're not medicating it. Yeah. So, well, and kind of sticking with emotions when you're like in conflict, what do you, I, cause I think sometimes there's like a couple of different ways people bring emotions into a conflict. It's like getting really angry and having that. And sometimes like being afraid of letting that anger into the conflict. And then I know like, and not to, I'm just making generalization, but like more often women will cry. And like mm -hmm. that kind of like taking over the conflict. So how do you guide people to navigate their emotions in a conflict with another yeah. person? Well, I might need to educate people about our conditioning that women are conditioned a certain way, generally speaking, and same with men. Mm -hmm. Men, it seems like we're allowed to express anger and that's like about it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, women, yeah, it's more sadness. And then if you express anger as a woman, you're a bitch, right? Which is so not okay to, to put women into that box. But, um, so there might be, we might need to do some education around that, but <clears throat> it's like the way my wife and I teach couples coaches how to work with couples is we have them turn and face each other. And, um, we have them begin to learn to read their faces, each other's faces, expressions, and to track each other. And in, in, to see that, to like, I see that you're angry right now, because sometimes we can't see ourselves. So our partner can actually really help us um, see ourselves more clearly. And we can get good at that. And we can also practice in a contained way um, with someone facilitating us. We can practice exp practice expressing anger directly. I, honey, I'm angry at you. I'm frustrated that this happened yesterday. Um, I'm really hurt by that thing you said like just eye contact, like actually saying the emotion directly. And then there's, okay, do you, do you want to, are you feeling that? Like, what else are you feeling? Where are you noticing that in your body? And, you know, we can certainly guide people deeper into their feelings. Um, but it's, it's important that we're in relationships where it's okay to express ourselves directly and our feelings directly with the other person. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of us don't have practice there, right? Because we got shut down as kids we got conditioned to not feel so feelings are scary and feelings make things worse for a lot of people is what, at least that's their narrative, but you can actually flip the whole script and learn that feelings actually make, make this relationship more robust and rich, deep, um, and powerful and more secure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. When you were describing facing your partner and actually like learning what anger looks like or sadness or confusion or frustration. We all kind of exhibit emotions in different ways. And it made me think about, I had, um, in a last relationship I was in, he had a dog and the dog would do this one thing where it would like raise its tooth and no one else would know, but that meant that the dog was like about to attack somebody, but mm -hmm. he learned that just by like 
watching his dog all the time and no one else would have noticed. And it's just really interesting because I think we can do that as people too, of like helping each other be like, Hey, I noticed that you're starting to like clench your fists or like your jaw is really tight. Yeah. What's going on? I yeah. notice you're having a hard day. I, I see it in your face. I see it in your vibe. And is there anything I can do? I'm I'm here for you, you know, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a really beautiful thing too, of especially if we're in relationship with someone that does struggle to understand their emotional life, to be able to kind of help guide in, in some ways, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. We had to do that with our kids um, when they were really little is uh, we actually went to a play therapist who came into our home to help me mostly communicate with my son better. And it was really amazing to watch her and have her teach me by showing me how to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. And she would say things like, you know, my son would be playing with blocks and he'd get frustrated. And she would just say, wow, you're really frustrated right now. So he began to learn what this was. And so then he could have language for, yeah, I'm, I'm frustrated in this. I don't like how this game is going or whatever. Mm -hmm. So parents have this really amazing opportunity to educate their kids about emotions as they're growing. But if parents are emotionally stunted, you know, kids are going to, their emotions are going to come out and parents usually don't know what to do with them. So they shut them down or they go away. And that's, that's really not what we want when we're raising kids. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's really amazing that you had that experience with the play therapist. Yeah. Um, So what would you say are like the top reasons people get into conflict? Oh, um, there's many. Um, I mean, depends on how you like, do you mean types of conflict or the reasons they get into it in the first place? Like what are the reasons people often fight? Yeah. Um, I'm going to take a guess right now. Um, <laughs> okay. I haven't talked about this in a while. Uh, probably, you know, they, they, they haven't learned how to work through value differences. Mm -hmm. I value this, you value that. Um, they haven't learned how to work with their nervous system and be able to communicate their activation effectively. Um, they grew up in a family that treated, you know, them a certain way and they think that this is how relationships go. So they haven't upgraded their map on how this stuff works. Uh, but often it's, it's little things like we just, we don't see something where we're misreading the situation. You know, we're, I see it this way, you see it that way. And then that leads to one of the most common sort of experiences is we both feel misunderstood, right? Mm -hmm. I don't feel like you get me. I don't feel like you're understanding my point of view. And that can go in circles if people don't know how to understand someone and they're just defending their position or arguing for their position. It just, I mean, it's amazing how that one will go on for years. Um, and people actually don't go get help. I'm just like, what are you guys doing? Like, it's just go yeah. ask for help. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's probably many others, but those are some that come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of in thinking about, this is something that I've questioned as well is like how to know when conflict is just part of a relationship versus when it's like, this is no longer just like a good relationship to be in, whether not like it's necessarily like toxic or really bad or something is just like, how do you navigate the difference between being like, this is a part of a relationship and this is conflict. And like, this is no longer an aligned relationship. Yeah. I mean, there's two types of people. There's the more codependent helper type person, which is often therapists, coaches, nurses, doctors, firefighters, cops, helpers Mm -hmm. are often over-functioning in all their relationships. And so those kind of people will stay in unhealthy relationships because they think that they can fix it. They can take responsibility. They can like do all the work. They can make this person better. They can get them into their potential. That's one type of person. The other type of person is like, what we'll just call a normal person or a a person who's just got probably less of a trauma history and they have a good radar for like, this is not good for me. No, thank you. And so they don't, it's not compelling. They they don't feel Mm -hmm. the same need to fix or help or make it better to stay in a toxic relationship. It's very straightforward for them to get the hell out of there. And like this, I don't hang out with people like this. So Mm -hmm. there's, 
you got to know your vulnerabilities, I think as a person, and I'm, I'm generalizing of course, to people in a certain camp, because I've just see that time and time again, um, the more codependent style of person, um, they stay longer because they really believe it's like they were little kids in a family that they thought they thought they could fix their parents mm -hmm. and they couldn't leave. They had one choice, which is try to make this family better. Yeah. Yeah. Like a commitment to making things healthier, better grow. Yeah. Yeah. What would yeah. you like? I just think about like being like addicted to this toxic, like that, like the highs and the lows that come and like people that are stuck in that trap mm -hmm. within a relationship. How do you get out of that? Well, I mean, with support, very few people can do that alone, mm. get out alone. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like getting super educated about humans and what a healthy relationship actually looks and sounds like. Because sometimes those people don't know any better because they grew up in a family like that. So they think, oh, this is just how relationships are. Mm -hmm they're kind of naive to no, no, this is not how relationships are. This is, this mm -hmm. is really hurtful. This is not good. Um, yeah. And it's, they're, they're often, it's like a recapitulation. They're, tr they're really trying to resolve their childhood, you know, through this adult mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. that's so dysfunctional. They're like, no, no, I can fix this and I, I can make this better. And that usually goes nowhere. So they've got to have really good coaches, therapists, um, you know, support groups of some kind, be reading, educating themselves, mm -hmm. you know, because extracting oneself usually is, is involved. The work is involved around self-worth. So like the more I increase my self-worth, the less I tolerate bullshit. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole journey is, well, how do you increase your self-worth? Like what, what do you actually do? And um, what are the steps? And people need to be like, yeah, this is my, the most important thing I need to do. It's not to make this unhealthy relationship work. It's to make me work, to make me mm. a more healthy, resilient person so that I can have the courage and tenacity to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, you have to want the help for yourself, not necessarily to like get the help so that you can have this relationship or so that you exactly. can be with this person. Yeah. 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 And, and I know, um, you know, you mentioned having a beautiful wife and children and, you know, just having that wonderful example of a relationship that's growing and, and working. And I would love to kind of understand when you say that relationship is a path, what that kind of means for you. Yeah. So my wife and I, we've been together 20 years or so minus a couple breakups. And then we got married and it's been 16 years and, um, you know, we still have our challenges, but we, our vows, we were really clear in the beginning and it helped both of us get on board with marriage because we were both anti-marriage and anti-kids mm -hmm. for most of our life until we started like really working on this. And we were like, actually we could do marriage on our terms mm -hmm. and we could do a very unconventional wedding and a very unconventional vows and kind of just, God, if we just had a blank canvas, what do we want to do here? Mm -hmm. And our, our vows were essentially about relationship is a spiritual path for us and it's a path to awakening and becoming who we are. And it's not about comfort and convenience. It's not about, um, happily ever after. It's not about a white picket fence in a house. It's about the work and it's about warriorship and it's about like, you know, we're going to get into it and we're going to grow as human beings and we're going to become better for it as individuals. And we're going to learn what's possible. Um, and we're going to go to the infinite. Like what is possible when two people come together? What can we co-create? What can we actually do together? Um, and it's been a, it's been an incredible ride and uh, it, we've, we've both been very true to those vows. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. And as you're saying that, I think about how, you know, we were talking about the inner conflict earlier and how we think we have to like, you know, be a certain way or fall into a certain box. And the same can be true for how we want our relationships to look like. People think that they have to make marriage mean X, Y, and Z traditionally yeah. or however. And we really have the freedom when we know who we are to ask for what we want in a certain type of relationship too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like that. Exactly. Like, Look, a, a healthy adult relationship should be where two people get to be themselves, you know, and they get to go after their dreams and the other person's like a cheer, cheerleader champion, you know, I'm taking a stand for your success kind of vibe, not like you're a pain in the ass and, you know, mm -hmm. you're making my life miserable. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And, um, I know we have just a few minutes left, but I would love to hear, um, there are so many other things I could ask you, but where can people find you to learn more about how to navigate relationships, about how to work through conflict effectively? I know you do a lot of wonderful work with men and couples and everybody. So, um, would love to hear where people can keep learning from you as they go. Yeah. Thanks. Relationshipschool.com is our main website. Um, you can find all the things there, our podcast. Um, my book is there. Uh, it's on Amazon, Getting to Zero. Um, yeah, and then I'm on all the social handles at Jason Gaddis, Jason with a Y. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Jason. And I really appreciate you being on the show today and sharing all of your wisdom. It's just really incredible to hear from someone that knows so much and has also lived um, what you're educating and speaking on. So it's really been great to have you. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been a a treat to be here. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The Naked Connection. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss another episode. Trust me on this, your sex life and that special someone in your life will thank you for it. And if you really love the show, please take a moment and leave a five-star review or a written review and let me know what you think. It would mean so much to me and the show. Until next time, happy connecting.